Uh, so when you're talking about organic molecules and solvent separate them strong enough to, to break a molecule apart, it's you can have that. It's you see it less as like the solvent being strong can break something else. You have to be making a better bond between the solvent molecule and whatever you're breaking off of the original molecule. Okay. Um, which is is something that we'll talk about in this class. There are there are reactions where the solvent can act as a reactant. Right. And that's kind of what you're talking about, right? I mean, yeah. you're pulling apart the original molecule. By using the solvent molecule as a way, as either as an acid or base, or as a nucleophile that's actually coming in and attaching to the rest of the organic molecule. Yeah, I guess I didn't really think about it as much as the reaction, because I was like indissolubility. I was yeah, preparing for the and when it's today. it's tied, it's all tied together though, because think about think about um, ionic compounds in in water, right? They separate into their distinct ions. Right. So you definitely can have that, and you definitely have that with like weak acids in water. But in that case, it's usually the the acid or the solvent is going to be acting as a as a base. Right. Um, so it's not just like you have H plus is floating around; they glom onto something else. So when you evaporate the solvent, it can be different than what you have put. It can be. It depends on how you move the solvent and how you know strong the acids are. But yeah, you can wind up with a totally new. Like if you put um, if you put ammonia ammonia NH three in water, you get equilibrium process where you make ammonium ammonium ions and hydroxide ions, which when you evaporate, if you try to separate those again. Typically, it'll go back to making these because these are both stable as gases, and this isn't stable as a gas. Gotcha. Um, but there are there are some cases where doing an acid base reaction, then removing the solvent, results in it staying in its charged form. Um, medications are a good example. Anytime you see something hydrochloride, um, like um, cough syrup, dextromethorphan, it's usually present as dextromethorphan hyperbromide is the way it's written. And because the dextromethorphan has a positive charge when it's neutrally um, neutral pH okay. and the bromide um, is there to balance out the charge. So you get this yeah, example with a plus charge and bromide with a minus charge when it's dissolved. But when you remove the solvent, you get DXM Bromide. Hmm. Okay, yeah. As an ionic compound. Got it. So acid base reactions are your the most common way you see this, but you do see it in a, in a lot of other stuff. Anytime, um, oh, there's a lot of, of organic compounds or biological compounds that water, um, like ruins their shelf life, right? Mm -hmm. Usually that's because the water is going to. Get in there and it's going to act either as a nucleophile or as an acid or a base. And it's going to get in there and sort of break apart some of the bonds that are already in there. So, with that in mind, could I look at solubility as a reaction between the solvent and the. I don't dislike that. I, I don't like that dichotomy between so physical versus like, chemical. I was looking at the other way, which seems wrong. But right. Like, Solubility, something dissolving, you can and you can write it as a chemical reaction. Something as a solid that turns into something aqueous or something dissolved. Um, right. Even if even if the solvent doesn't create a, a reaction, um, as, you know, even if it's a spectator ion, it looks like a spectator ion, you still have something different on both sides: a solid versus aqueous, right? Right. Right. So. Good question, though. Um, it's, all, it's all about frame of reference yeah. in chemistry a lot of the time, right? Absolutely. In, in defining your, your frame of reference. So I asked this question because I had the molecule draw down on like a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And my sister, she's already taken organic chemistry. She looked at it and she was like, isn't it supposed to be SP2? And she said it was because of like some sort of like resonance 
with the oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But for this quiz, it was asking this quiz, I just wanted you to treat it okay. like normal. But you asked me, it's a good question though, because um, it has three bonding regions and a lone pair region. It still is SP3 because that's what allows it to be tetrahedral. Right. In order to be in tetrahedral, allows all those electrons to stay apart from each other more. Um, and so lone pairs still affect hybridization for right. that reason. Yeah. It's more just the electron electron repulsion, not to make extra bonds. Right. Okay. Um, which also means they're not locked into it as much because it's not as much of an energy benefit um, or a, a stabilization benefit to to stay in the hybridization. And that's why lone pairs can act as sp2 if there's something else going on that allows them to become more stable. It's okay. basically like they're they're the first ones off the ship okay. when things start looking like there's a greener pastures. <laughs> they, the lone pair of electrons don't stay hybridized if there's some other way they can become more stable. Okay. Um, if you took that molecule though, and stop using this, I can use that. Okay. Well, she wrote on the smart bit, Sharpie. <laughs> oh, come on. She was panicking. And I, I just went up with the uh, expo marker. Just expo on Sharpie, you can just erase it. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? And she was so relieved. <laughs> so here's an example of a molecule that where you've got books that has the theming group. Exactly. And then and then it has all these other double bonds. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about resonance, we'll talk about why it does that. Uh, but you can actually force it. If you take that lone pair, if you protonate it, it causes to act as a, as a weak base. And you protonate it to make the same molecule. But now it's NH3 over here with a plus charge. Now it's stuck in SP3. Oh, once you make a sigma bond with it, now it's like, oh, sigma bonds are so stable, it'll stay this way. When it's still a lone pair, it's easy enough for it to move around and go through this resonance that we're going to talk about. Okay. So it, it is all about like relative energy levels. Um, and lone pairs are, it's a lot easier for them to, to stay or to become what's called delocalized electrons. Um, let's see, um, for this class, we're mainly going to be dealing with carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen when it comes to hybridization, never hydrogen. But and the other thing, and I'm going to, the last question really is going to make this point, drive this point home. Um, but really hybridization is sort of a conceptual and mathematical abstraction. Nature doesn't hybridize these existing atomic orbitals. It's just like nature doesn't need to plot out what the, the fastest way for water to flow downhill is. It just does it. It just does it, yeah. It's just the way the universe behaves. And so hybridization is similar. We use these mathematical models and concepts to represent what we see in the real world, but it's not like some things hybridize and some things don't. Hybridization is just a tool for understanding that these electrons will always be in their most, we're all, we'll always tend to find their lowest energy state. And the lowest energy state can be approximated with these combinations of, of atomic orbitals. Um, and Will the elements, will the hybridization rules remain the same, or are there instances where they change? This is chemistry, they always change. As soon as we get comfortable with something, we're going to add more wrinkles, right? Um, and that's coming later today when we talk about resonance. And then Ed got a little wordy. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> you wrote your message. <laughs> but I threw it on here rather than just answering it on the quiz because it is a good that's question to talk about. Um, <laughs> So, and actually, this, this actually ties into something else I was going to show you today. Um, which classes offer deeper understanding of the subject? Basically, that physical chemistry, too, 
is an entire class of quantum mechanics. But physical chemi chemistry is, at its basis is just where physics and chemistry overlap from the chemist's point of view. And physics usually has a similar upper division class, but they call it chemical physics. Um, and, the phys and the chemists call it physical chemistry. Um, but it's definitely like a gray area where it's both. It's applied to physics, taking physics rules, quantum mechanic rules, and applying it to real world situations in a way that physics doesn't sometimes. That's good to know. I was looking at that class last night, actually. Yeah, it's PCHEM's really interesting, PCHEM 2 specifically. You, and sometimes in some schools, it's a different class. PCHEM can be like designing um, internal combustion engines, the math behind how you extract work from stuff like that. That's in my undergrad, that was called PCHEM 1 in classical physical chemistry. But then some schools will call it PCHEM 2, or sometimes they'll just call it quantum. Um, and then statistical mechanics is actually the math behind thermodynamics, math behind equilibrium, and and the and everything. Um, so statmec is a little bit different in terms of usually statmec isn't quantum, you're just in time. Okay. So I mean, everybody showed up in the right order for their questions. Um, so so statmec is really interesting, but it's really pure statistics and very little calculus and very little quantum. Um, quantum mechanics and PCAM are oftentimes the same class. Um, and it really depends on what department you're taking it in. But their physics department will teach the same thing as the chemistry department, but the name of the class will be different and they will have like different applications or different amount of focus on the map. Um, would the physics then be more theoretical and the, the and more focused on the derivations and actually solving the math as best you can and whereas the chemistry is more phys chemistry is more focused on the applications and here's the net result here's how it applies to different elements different compounds um and all of those both have their there's undergrad stat mech, and then there's grad level stat mech, and there's undergrad quantum, and then there's grad level quantum, right? So you can keep going more and more in depth with a lot of these um, if you wind up in grad school in one of these departments. Um, and it does get, you wind up being able to take classes. In grad school, it's, you're not locked into taking classes just from the department you're in. It's a lot like undergrad where you can take stuff in, from different departments. So like I took a grad level class in electrical engineering um, because my research was on photovoltaics. And so I needed to understand how the electrical engineers think about solar cells. So I took a class from the EE department and I took classes in the chemistry and the chemical engineering and the physics departments. Um, was it really hard to take that class? The EE one was, was the most different than what I was used to. Um, chemistry and physics and even chemical engineering. Chem chemical engineering was my home department, so I was kind of learning their language already. EE e. was really far removed from my background because my undergrad was pure chemistry. And then I switched to engineering thinking it's close to the same thing. It turns out it's not close to the same thing. <laughs> uh, it was close enough I was able to make it work, but it was tricky. Um, and it was a totally different language and point of view in things. Um, so, but, so there's absolutely differences in approach and objectives. And part of it is just, are we trying to really understand the fundamental underpinnings? Or are we trying to, to understand how it shows up in the real world? Or are we trying to understand how we can monetize this or optimize this? Because that's more the engineering side. How do we take something that we understand kind of and design a startup with it or optimize an existing process, you know, takes taking something that like a, an oil refinery, um, chemical engineering historically, chemical engineering as a field has only been around since about the sixties. Um, it existed before that, but mainly as just like an offshoot of chemistry. Um, and it wasn't until, until oil refiners really started like drilling down, oh, well, we get another 1% efficiency, um, that's going to make us another $100 billion this year. 
Um, so that's what I mean by optimization is taking something that exists and finding inefficiencies and correcting them or redesigning them to, to have a better overall yield. Um, definitely fun areas. Um, and then you can go the entirely opposite way and be a science educator, um, not just as a teacher, but um, one of my the high school students asked um, a question yesterday that made me, that we were talking about other jobs that were not research-based or engineering-based or in higher education um, or K-12 education. And there's actually a lot of cool jobs working in science policy. Um, you know, if you that every every politician above a certain level has a has a policy science policy advisor whose job is to keep up on what's happening in science and then communicate it in the way that the politician can understand and formulate their policy. Looks like a hell of a job. It's it's, <laughs> it's kind of really cool. It's, it's like having a a class of one where my job is just, I'm gonna go out and like, oh, look at this cool research that they just found on solar on solar farms in Arizona. How does that apply to Southern California? And the, if my politician is from Southern California, I'd say, okay, well, we can either like start looking at promoting piping energy from Arizona, or we can build our own, but it's like talking with them about feasibility and environmental impacts and stuff like that. So like there's there's a lot of cool jobs in science and like even working for TRBA, like how like we have these new these new state laws for these bins that are around town, right? How is that is that going to negatively affect um, drainage because now we have these plastic bins sitting out in the rain and in the snow all all, all winter? Um, is that going to affect runoff? Is that going to change anything? You need somebody to actually go out there and measure stuff. And, and then explain it to local politicians. Hey, we shouldn't be doing this. Or, hey, here's how we mitigate this. Or, hey, everything's fine. Um, so there's, there's lots of good areas you can go into if you can get good at communicating in science. If you can get communicate science to, to lay people well, then you can communicate with anyone, um, which is always a useful skill. You can, that's always marketable in one way or another. You just don't go into advertising. That's <laughs> that's the dark. That's the dark area. We don't go in there. That's where some politics does that. It's just advertising. <laughs> and there's some of that too, but they actually have the power to actually change things. So there's still an incentive to uh, try and impact things positively. There, advertising. I don't want to know what scientists they talked to when they came up with <laughs> targeting alcohol and water. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right, more to the point though. Um, so does the electron, if you have two different hybridizations like carbon monoxide or carbon, or sorry, carbon dioxide, the carbon was SP and the oxygen was SP2. The thing is, is and, and I think you may have not have been in here, that hybridization really is an abstraction. Nature doesn't hybridize, right? It just sort of the electrons naturally find their lowest energy state. But in terms of the way we understand this, um, remember that we have, we start from the atomic orbitals and then we treat them like they hybridize to make something like sp2, sp3, et cetera. And then those hybridize with the nearby orbitals with the, to make another level um, that are the molecular orbitals. So once you have, we can approximate the hybridization of the oxygen and the carbon as being sp2 and sp respectively. But once they actually make a bond, then it's not really sp2 and sp anymore. Now it's a sigma bond is made up of overlapping an sp2 bond or an sp2 orbital and an sp orbital so it's a new energy level so it's not really that there's two separate energy levels anymore once you make that bond it's one energy level that's even lower in energy than either the sp2 or the sp1 does that make sense and the analogy that i used with these two earlier was that 
Nature doesn't actually mess with any of the math here, right? The math is our way of representing what happens on its own spontaneously in nature. Just like water doesn't stop to calculate what the path of least resistance is when it's flowing downhill, it just does it. Right? And so electrons are the same way. They naturally, instead of flowing downhill physically, they're flowing downhill energetically and cooling, if you will, in that state that's the lowest energy. Um, and so you wind up not with, with two, if you did wind up with two different energy states that were really close to the same energy level, then yeah, the ratio of how many electrons are low energy state to the high energy state is gonna be based on the temperature. You can wind up with them bouncing back and forth as an equilibrium process. And that follows our same standard equilibrium rules Remember this equation? It was e to the negative delta g over delta g. Big up. Delta g is your difference in energy states too, right? Electrons follow this rule, this distribution as well. This is just the Boltzmann distribution, right? So this is just the statistics of our physical universe has this rule where based on, if you have two different energy states and it can be electronic states, it can be products and reactants, it can be anything. Um, the ratio that you find them at this energy level versus say this higher energy level, the at equilibrium is gonna be based entirely on what is that delta G and what is the temperature? Is it one out of every million molecules is at the higher energy state or is it one out of every thousand molecules is at the higher energy state? That, that is all based on the temperature. So really low temperatures, you favor keeping everything in the low energy state. As you get to higher and higher temperatures, you wind up with them being more evenly distributed. If at an infinitely high temperature, they would be equally distributed. At an infinitely high temperature, all energy states are equally probable because every electron has enough energy to be anywhere at any given time. Although it turns out you can't actually, well, I shouldn't say like say this like it's a surprise. You can't actually have an infinite energy. Um, because if you think about the fact that these molecules, even if there was a way to do that, um, there's a hard speed limit on how fast molecules can move, right? Temperature is really just the kinetic energy of the molecules. And if you had infinite kinetic energy, you'd have infinite velocity on them. And you can't have infinite velocity because nothing can move faster than speed of light. So our hard limit as to what is the biggest, the most energy you could possibly have is, is when those molecules start approaching relativistic speeds. You can't get any hotter than, than those molecules moving at the speed of light or even reach the speed of light really, right? I'm trying to remember. So electrons, the lower energy levels, they have to move faster, right? They do. Um, because they're the same temperature and they have less potential energy. So they have more kinetic energy, to put it in physics terms. Inverse um, thing. Inverse function. Yeah, well, and just because so the, the average kinetic energy of an electron is based on the temperature. Um but the further away the electron is from the nucleus, it can have more kinetic energy, but still be, I guess it's, that's not quite the right way to phrase that. I don't want to violate the laws of physics here. Um, they typically are, be, are moving faster in the core because they're being pulled more strongly by the nucleus. Just like a, if we talked about purple space program last week, um, a satellite that's in low Earth orbit is actually moving faster than a satellite that's at, in high Earth orbit. But the satellite that's at high Earth orbit has more energy because it's further away from Earth. So we have more energy up in the mountains than someone at sea level? In Maybe theory, it's yes. Just, it's just yeah, like it's just forces. centripetal forces and just we're further away from the center of gravity of the Earth. So we have further to fall. We have more of the heart because we're further right. away from the that. So, yeah. Rotational stuff does make it a little bit weird too. That gets a bit wonky. But um, when we were doing computational chemistry when I was in grad school, if you were doing 
if you were um, doing calculations using some of the heavier metals, you actually had to take into account relativistic effects on the core electrons of something like gold, say. The electrons are moving fast enough that they're actually approaching relativistic speeds in the core um, energy levels because they're so close to the surface of the nucleus and they're being pulled so tightly. So in double bonds and a pi bond, would you see any kind of, I mean, I guess you wouldn't really see it, but would electrons move from the lower energy levels to the higher energy levels, like shift around as they would in between? Not between the sigma bonds and the pi bonds, because the pi bond is already occupied. Gotcha. Okay. So a lot of times what you wind up having, what you wind up um, seeing is you wind up making the energy for, a, for the sigma bond, and then there's energy for the sigma star bond, and then higher in energy is the pi bond, and then the, the pi star, which is the antibonding. So if you had two pairs of electrons to put into these four states, they're gonna wind up here and here, right? If you, so that means that there's not really a way to move the electrons from the sigma bond to the pi bond because the pi bond's already filled. You can move the sigma bond to the pi star bond or the pi bond to the pi star bond or the pi bond all the way up to the sigma star bond. And that's gonna correlate with break, partially breaking the bond between those two atoms. Um, and if, if all you have is a sigma bond and you shine the right wavelength of light on it, to bump an electron all the way up here, you actually break the bond because now you have just as many electrons in the anti-bonding orbital as the bonding orbital and the whole thing flies apart. And so that's why UV light actually causes things to break down faster. Anything that absorbs light in the visible region, like dyes, for instance, typically also have a, um, have a lot of transitions in the low UV the trend that correspond to promoting electron into antibonding orbitals. And so that's why dyes, if you leave them, if you expose them to UV light over long periods of time, they stop being colored, right? It's because you're actually physically breaking apart the molecules, is chemically, but you're literally breaking apart the molecules that are responsible for giving that garment color because you're moving electrons from low energy states to high energy states, which allows the molecules sort of fall apart. So between sigma and um, the electrons in the S orbital, the first. So those four be... electrons are even harder to promote because there's an even bigger energy difference. It's okay, theoretically so... possible, but you have to get to really high energy light gotcha. um, to involve the core electrons just because when we're talking about moving these at different energy levels, this is all within the valence band, and that core electrons are way lower in energy than that. They're on the floor compared to where I was drawn here. So you can shine high, enough, high energy light. It's enough to bump them all the way from the core up to an antibonding orbital or something like that. But it's really rare because there's not that much light around, and it takes a lot of energy to do that. It's like ionization energy, right? Yeah, that's basically, we're starting to approach something like ionization energy, um, which for for organic molecules is, we're like into the, the gamma, probably past the gamma radiation stage, into the cosmic radiation stage, um, which if you read a lot of comic books, these are all fun words to say. <laughs> to start talking about the cosmic radiation and, um, <laughs> But it's, yeah, the, it's a real thing, right? High enough energy light, there's, there's, even our sun puts out some extremely high energy photons that are even past gamma radiation um, that they call cosmic radiation. And those, now we're starting to get to the point where we could talk about, okay, maybe those might have enough energy to promote something from the, from the core. Mm -hmm. um, but generally it's more stable. Yeah, for the most part, under normal circumstances, we don't deal with four electrons. That's why we just kind of ignore the valences and valence and the unoccupied um, orbitals are where the more interesting things happen. 
Um, this is the, I, I did hit record, didn't I? I just panicked for a second. Um, we talked about this a little bit about how when you start adding high bonds, bond lengths gets, gets shorter. So a carbon, and I was off by a little bit, I said 1.44, it was 1.54 angstroms is a carbon-carbon single bond. Um, when you add a, a pi bond to make it a double bond, it's 1.34 angstroms. And the energy required to break it, which again is tied to what we were just talking about, the energy that you would have to put in to just completely rip these apart um, homolytically, uh, the energy goes up. It's, you get 368 kilojoules per mole to form this carbon carbon sigma bond. And then it takes 632 kilojoules per mole to pull apart a sigma bond and a pi bond. Why isn't that 700 and 736? Because the sigma bond is stronger than the pi bond. Bingo. So because the sigma bond has better bond overlap, it's stronger, which means it takes more energy to pull it apart. So a sigma bond is in the ballpark between any, any two atoms, the sigma bond is gonna be in this same ballpark, but carbon to carbon is always gonna be something like 368 kilojoules per mole for a sigma bond. And then it's not quite double that to do a sigma bond and a pi bond. So the energy of the pi bond is the difference between these two. So 632 minus 368, whatever that difference is. 264. 264, excellent. Um, that's the energy of, of a pi bond, which should be really close to the difference between these two as well. It's not exactly the same because there's some, some other effects happening as well, but it's pretty close to the same energy here, right? Because going from a double bond to a triple bond, we still have the sigma bond. Now we added a second pi bond. And both pi bonds should be close to the same amount of energy. Would that increase the energy held by the sigma bond having two pi bonds bringing them closer together with more overlap? Um, maybe a little bit. Remember, we already kind of found this, this lowest play point on that potential energy surface by bringing them closer together to make these pi bonds. <laughs> um, yeah, you get better sigma bond overlap, but you also are increasing the the um, repulsion between the two carbon uh, nuclei. So that probably offsets. The other one's like 188. So. 18, so because you're forcing, and that's probably where that repulsion is showing up, because you're bringing them closer together to make the second pi bond, but you're increasing the repulsion between the two nuclei, it's not, you don't get quite as strong a pi bond the second time. All right, so what are the other things that affect um, the bond energies here and the bond lengths? Well, the biggest one is going to be electronegativity. Who remembers electronegativity? Polar bonds, right? And when we're talking about polar bonds, we mainly were just talking about, okay, well, look at the two atoms that are participating in a bond. And if the difference in electronegativity is at a certain threshold, it's like 0. 0.4, 0. 0.4, um, then we consider it to be a polar bond. Good memory. Um, and the way that I always, I use to, to be a little bit more specific is carbon, hydrocarbons are non, totally nonpolar. So use carbon to hydrogen as your cutoff. Anything that's more polar than a carbon hydrogen bond is considered a polar bond. So it's a, it actually, if you use that logic, it's a little bit less than 0.4 if you have if you have more decimal points. Um, but either way, for this class, the bulk of what we're going to be looking at is these atoms here plus hydrogen. So for the, and we might, uh, there's probably, there's a little bit of phosphorus we'll get to at some point, and there's some metals that are doing some organometallic stuff towards the end of this quarter, um, because carbon being a low enough electronegativity means it actually can make a covalent bond with some metals. 
in particular, aluminum and magnesium wind up being used a lot in organometallic chemistry because you can make a fairly stable bond between a carbon and an aluminum or a hydrogen and an aluminum. Um, but you can't say between an, ox an oxygen and an aluminum is not a valent bond because the difference in electronegativity is so great. Um, and this is just kind of, this is a fun one to play with. This is from P-Table. Um, you can, you know, it has all those different, uh, it's an interactive periodic table that have, you can color the periodic table by all sorts of different properties and change what it looks like. Um, and so if you, so if you uh, color it by, according to what negativity you use a linear scale, this is what you see. All right, what does that look like in terms of these molecules? Well, when we when we actually make a covalent bond between two atoms of different electronegativities, we actually see it. Um, what's referred to as a partial charge transfer, where you've still got a covalent bond. You still have electrons that are in both valences at the same time, but they're preferentially being pulled one direction. And so if you take um, a polar molecule, if you do some computational chemistry to it and look at where all these, all these orbitals are, if you sum where the orbitals are, um, you like to take all of the orbitals, all the valence orbitals and add them together, you can get an idea of where the charges are around the molecule. Um, you can see what's called the dipole. And dipole just means that it's it's another way of saying polar, it just means it has a partial positive and a partial negative. So anything polar is a dipole because it has a part, a positive end and a negative end. Just how positive they, and negative they are depends on what atoms are present and how electronegative they are. So fluorine attached to a carbon, that's a pretty big change in electronegativity. Fluorines are most electronegative. Oh, like a 3.98 to 2.55. That's well above our 0.4 cutoff, right? In fact, that's approaching a an ionic bond. Which is what, like 1.8, Depending on what textbook you look at, they'll, they'll classify it a little bit differently. But that's, I mean, we're definitely in the 1.5 region, right? 1.4. Where do these numbers come from? They just seem a little like... They are a little bit abstract. They actually... They're called degrees Pauli, <laughs> Pauli, after Linus Pauli, uh, because in addition to his work with hybridization, he also came up with a scale for rating how electronegative elements <laughs> work. Um, and I don't, I don't actually know the physical process, the experiments that that were used to to determine this. It's but it's effectively unitless, and you never use degrees Pauli in a calculation other than just like, is it polar or not? Um, so it kind of just gets kind of hand waved away like I'm doing now. Yeah. Don't ask too many questions <laughs> um, because what, well, if you actually wanted to do the calculations, you have to do it like this. And then it, it all comes back to degrees polling is based on um, how close is an energy level to being filled? How many protons are in the nucleus? How many core electrons are there? What energy level are we in? If you take all of that and put it together, which the calculations do, then you get something that says, well, there's more electrons on this side than that side because of where the protons are distributed and how close everything is. Um, and so it's basically just a way to get around having to calculate all of those variables every time. Say, well, here's a nice sum summary of, of all of that without getting into the nitty gritty. Does that make sense? Like, just said, like, or it is like, that's I believe it was something along those lines. Yeah, it was like, we know fluorine is the most electronegative, so we're just going to set that in between zero and, and um, four. Hydrocarbons have dipole moments. Though, Small ones, Small type. because they're one because they're uniform. It's all carbons and hydrogens, and and because carbons and hydrogens are so mm -hmm. close to the same electronegativity, and so their their electrons wind up being pretty uniformly distributed. If you look at 
at this charge map. Um, they call this uh, the dipole moment or the uh, electrostatic surface. I don't remember what the term is. I made this figure and I don't remember what the <laughs> buttons were in that, but it's been, a, it's been a, while, a while. But if you just look at the difference in color between the hydrogen and the carbon, they're almost the same charge, right? As far as the electron density goes, versus the fluorine is pulling so many more electrons around it that these are kind of all washed out. If we got rid of this and we just looked at charge on, say, methane, just CH4, we'd see a, maybe a little bit of fluctuation, but there, even those are still going to be really close to the same charge on the, the carbon in the middle versus the hydrogens on the outside. So, polarity is just a reference point from carbon hydrogen bonds. I, I use that. I don't know if that was originally what they used to make that point more cut off. I just, when I was a student, I noticed that those, that it was a handy way for me to remember that it was 0. 0.4. I don't know if that was the original thought process behind calling it 0. 0.4. I mean, it's just a measurement. It's just, it's just a measurement in all of it's really is just a spectrum, right? It's not like there's a hard cutoff where, oh, well, it's nonpolar versus another like hundredth of a of a degree polling and all of a sudden they, now it's polar. It's a it's a spectrum where even the non-polar bonds have some degree of polarity. And I'm sure there's a limit to the you know, actual variation of what numbers can be pulled out of that equation. Right, exactly. Yeah. So exactly. Um so we can go through the process of actually determining whether molecules are polar or not. Um, with these small molecules it can be a, a little bit tricky um, and you would have to start, this is this is pure review from Gen Chem, right? You probably saw this exact slide, except it's Carl's formatting instead of mine. Um, you know, you pick your central atom, count your electrons, distribute your electrons. And then the main thing, if you wanna know if it's polar or not, what were the two questions we had to ask? Um, it was if it's asymmetrical. Yeah. And then the value, the value, the actual like degree of polar difference. Now, are there polar bonds? The polar bonds, yeah. If you no. it's a polar molecule. Would that be saying the same thing as what Jeremy was saying for the, the uh, polar bonds are the difference between those two numbers, the electron. Exactly. So we, we need to not just look at, we're not necessarily comparing the hydrogen to the chlorine if the hydrogen doesn't have a bond to a chlorine. Right. You're looking at like the bond between exactly. the two. So for MHCl2, looks that structure is going to look like this. It has asymmetry for sure. Does it have any polar bonds? Well, nitrogen to chlorine, no polarity difference there to speak of within sig figs. Yeah. So if you have one of them, if it's like asymmetrical, but there's no difference and it's still not polar. Correct. You need to be able to say yes to both of those both questions. You need asymmetry and polar bonds. Would this but sort of be polar? It would. Because of the nitrogen to hydrogen. Yeah. yeah. So nitrogen to hydrogen is a polar bond, even though nitrogen to chlorine is so not. So it would have like a slightly electronegative region. Right. This is going to be not as polar as NH3 because it has fewer polar bonds. Basically, the, the bigger the difference in electronegativity and the more of those polar bonds you have, the more polar the overall molecule is. Will the lone pair of electrons work into the polarity at all? Um, they don't. Not really. Okay, I'll accept that. <laughs> they, they, affect, they affect the asymmetry. Right. So, for, for instance, if it was... It would just be shifting the, the bond angles, right? Well, yeah, it, it shifts the bond angles a little bit because the lone pair takes up more space. 
So it like pushes everything also. pushes everything a little way. So it affects that, and it it'll affect the fact that that the that is asymmetric at all. Because like C eight or N H four with the plus charge just got a charge, but it's still not polar because it's symmetric. Oh, okay, interesting. So you can have an ion that's non-polar. Right. So sodium ion is non-polar. Exactly, because the whole thing has a charge. It doesn't have a partial positive and a partial negative. The whole thing is a positive. That's just really important. The whole reference point. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so but is this one NH3? Is this one polar? It is. Okay. So is ammonia is polar, not as polar as water, though. Same, roughly the same size. But because oxygen is even more electronegative, even though this has three polar bonds and water only has two polar bonds, each of the polar bonds is stronger, is more polar when it's an oxygen and hydrogen. So, so water is more polar than this, and the, which would look like a larger color shift but from side to side. If you see some fluctuation in the color from one side of the molecule to the other, then it's polar, but the larger this, the gradient, you can actually put numbers to it. This, this might have like a, a plus 0.6, and this might be a minus 0.6. And they call that the measuring the dipole moment. You, when that's where this graph comes from, this figure comes from, is actually numerically you actually set a pause, a number, the value. Okay, here's our most negative part of the molecule. We'll call that green, and our most positive part of the molecule. We'll call that red. And it just develops a gradient in between the two. But yeah, it's it's definitely. There's degrees of polarity that are based on how asymmetric it is, how strong the polar bonds are, how polar the bonds are, and how many of them do you have relative to the size of the molecule. So ammonia would be nonpolar, correct? Do you correct. Have the symmetry. Because it's totally symmetric, right? It's tetrahedral. So yes, that nitrogen has a positive charge, but it's also surrounded completely by these hydrogens that are exactly oppositely pointed from each other so that they're completely canceling each other out. Can you draw ammonia like that? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, Just visualize it. <laughs> so in this one, each of these is still a polar bond, just like over there. But here you've got a little bit of a pull. The electrons are being pulled that way, that way, that way. Those electrons aren't being pulled between two atoms the same way. Versus here, you have all of one, the electrons are all being pulled the same way here, which means there's a net, sorry, I got, let me finish my thought. There's a net pull upward here. So a lot of these are canceling each other out, right? They're approximately 120 degrees from each other, but they're not exactly 120 degrees from each other. So even though all of the electrons are kind of being pulled in, in opposite directions, there's still a net movement upward. Here, all three of these ones are still the same now, but there's also that pole, which counteracts the other three. They exactly can cancel each other out, just like vectors in, in physics. So there's like nothing that's like pulling it in one direction. It's just all going. It's all something. uniform. Yeah. And if it's all uniform, then it all cancels each other out. And there's no net movement of the electrons. The analogy that I always use is like a tug of war between, between NFL teams. If they're all going to be about the same strength, right? It's going to be, they used to do this instead of the Pro Bowl. After the Super Bowl, the two Super Bowl teams would go to Hawaii and they would do all these like feats of strength. <laughs> um, and then it would culminate with the tug of war between the two teams. And there was one year where the tug of war between the two Super Bowl teams lasted for like an hour and a half. 
<laughs> they were like calling in subs and like, okay, take take it. I'm gonna I gotta take a break. Let me get water. <laughs> um, and that's so that's kind of what's happening here. Yeah, you might have really strong elements pulling these electrons, but if they're all pulling in exactly opposite directions, there's no net movement. If you replace one of those NFL teams with a high school football team, then all of a sudden you get net movement, right? The electrons get pulled towards the NFL team, the more electronegative element. Um, and in a case like If we had something like a carbon in the middle, tetrahedral with fluorines all around it, so it's a little bit easier to visualize the um, pulling the Tupperware analogy by putting more electronegative element on the outside. Same logic applies to the nitrogen, the, the NH4 plus we were just talking about, but it's easier to see here. Carbon is a peewee football team. It's in the middle of a four-way tug of war between four NFL teams. Doesn't matter that they're even there, right? They're not affecting which way anything's going, right? <laughs> if you take one of the NFL teams, one of the four NFL teams, and you replace it with a Pee Wee football team, now these three are still fighting thing for, for things, but you can imagine there's going to be a net movement, though, because even though these three teams are more or less canceling each other out, that one's not doing anything. Right, and so that one's just along for the ride, being pulled with them. So there's going to be a net movement as soon as you have asymmetry. You like double bonds? <laughs> double bonds, it, they do, but for the most part, they're still going to be considered um, polar bonds. So one of the examples that was on that other slide, this is formaldehyde. The Lewis dot structure looks like this. We definitely have um, these are nonpolar bonds, but carbon oxygen's polar, right? So this and this polar bond, and then we also have asymmetry, right? Pee wee football team, pee wee football team, high school football team, NFL team. So electrons are still definitely being pulled upward the way it's oriented here. Um, is it a, a, a double bond is has a slightly different polarity? I believe it's actually more polar, but I actually would have to double check that for the most part, it's still just classified as being polar. Um, I would think of that being closer, it would be more repulsion, like you were saying before. Well, I'm going based on the fact that formaldehyde has a measurable boiling point that's relatively close to zero Celsius, but diethyl ether, dimethyl ether's boiling point is like minus four Celsius. And this has more polar bonds, but they're only sigma bonds versus this one has um, fewer polar bonds. It's a smaller molecule, so it should actually have a, a lower boiling point. But there are other things that go along with that too, so I'm, I'm wary of trusting my instinct on that one too much. This one, it looks symmetric the way it's drawn, kind of like that one does, but because that oxygen is sp3, it's actually tetrahedral electron geometry, so there's still so now we've got our NFL team playing tug of war with two Pee Wee football teams. It's still the NFL team still going to win, right? I actually would. That's something that I would probably I would watch on TV. I'm not sure I would pay to watch it, but if I was going through the channels and I saw especially tug of war, that would be tug of war fifth grader. <laughs> All right, let's take a break. Let's get your 10 out of here. Should watch some more. <laughs> Flying in the air. <laughs> You're just holding on, swinging. <laughs>
Like wipe out. Like you have to pretend like you're watching. I don't remember why it out. That was so fun. Me and my family used to just gather around the TV and watch Wipe Out. Did you ever watch the, the Japanese game show that it was based on? They they basically I did it all with, it. with uh, overdubs. And so they had like comedians doing the overdubs, <laughs> like Mystery Science Theater. Um, and but it, and that one was hilarious because they would make up characters and they had no idea. It was made by people that didn't speak Japanese. They just had the raw oh, video. That's hilarious. No, I, I think I've seen it once, but I, we mostly just stuck with the uh, white note. When I was in college, that was on Comedy Central late at night, talking times. And so it's like at three in the morning. Um, just leave that on fall asleep <laughs> and do it. And it would always wake up to either Scrubs or um, White Girls it was always on Comedy Central at like six in the morning. So funny. You know, it's like, who makes these decisions? I thought they said chem beer ball. <laughs> Chemistry of beer. Yeah. PNG. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Thinking about getting some of these printed and uh, putting them in the new lab. I like it. Because I always appreciate it. Maybe revolvers instead of rooms. <laughs> um, you know, this is, uh, have you ever watched Archer? Uh, the the, the, com the cartoon, yeah. yeah, yeah a bit. Um, the the scientist, the med scientist Krieger, has this poster up in his lab. Nice. And I always thought it was a good one. And I found a good high quality copy of it. The boss says, Do you want ants? Because this is how we get ants. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> um, but what was it was actually did I pull up? It was. I wanted to ask you if you could make the. Uh... Next lab available to view the extraction one. Yes. At some point. I mean, I know we're doing that. Yeah, before. remind me when we're in lab when I have my laptop. Okay. It's easier for me to get to Canvas and yeah. and do that gotcha. when I have my laptop. I just like um, to prepare for it kind of thing. This yeah. one took me a while to write up and everything. So yeah. This is Well, something else I wanted to ask you, is there any reaction between caffeine and acetaminophen? I don't think caffeine and acetaminophen, acetaminophen is, so most, most medications uh, or recreational drugs are hard on one organ or another. Usually it's the liver and the kidneys because that's what's responsible for filtering out foreign chemicals. Mm -hmm. um, Tylenol in particular is rough on your kidney, on your uh, liver, especially if you take it with alcohol. 
So Tylenol, you definitely don't want to use Tylenol if you've been drinking or even hung over because you still have alcohol in your system because it actually makes a compound that's about 10 times more damaging when you mix them together than either one of them on their own. Like okay. alcohol is bad, Tylenol is bad, but together is 10 times worse, not just double. Right. What about the I'm, uh, is ibuprofen? Ibuprofen, you, alcohol is rough on your stomach. Oh, interesting. That just in your stomach. Yeah, you can wind up giving yourself ulcers right. um, or uh, or um, acid reflux sort of issues if you if you do that. But it's a lot more manageable. It's not going to kill you um, the way that uh, Tylenol and alcohol can. Um, so caffeine and caffeine ibuprofen, and ibuprofen. Most <laughs> most of the drugs that are this size. Molecules don't interact too much. Okay. Alcohol is sort of a special case because you have to you way more of it in terms of concentrations and dose. Other drug really no drug you actually get to the point where it's a measurable fraction of your right. blood. <laughs> right. Um, so because the relative concentrations are are so low with other drugs, unless they happen to be in the same systems in your brain, then typically you don't see a whole lot of interaction. Okay. The, um, I copy it and I <laughs> So I just want to make sure on that. <laughs> I don't please, so if I would I would have more health problems if that was a problem. <laughs> and uh, considering the polarity of the two, they wouldn't interact because it's can we play with that? They're okay. they're interacting with different different systems in the brain. So caffeine is a dopamine agonist, if I'm remembering correctly, which means that it um, it causes the the brain to release excess dopamine. Um, but that's a totally different neurotransmitter system than what ibuprofen does, which is basically blocking pain signals. Which Doesn't is, caffeine also block um, signals that I forget what it's called? On a different on a different, different system, system though. System. It's yeah. still the pain system, but it's more um more directly what's directly um, interacting because caffeine's a topical anesthetic, not a central anesthetic. Okay. Like you can't rub ibuprofen on a cut and numb it. Um, you can rub caffeine or a lot of different stimulants on a cut to numb it because but that's working at a different part of the pain system yeah yeah i was reading into roller <laughs> roller last night oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. yeah i was looking caffeine and something about uh let me sign it got it mm -hmm. the first word in it Mom, right right yeah that, that whole thing he also did something with cocaine with a topical like you're saying, which does all oh, the chemists in the 1800s, they they were like Freud, they were all, yeah, they were all on cover all the time <laughs> because it's a wonder drug. Why wouldn't you? But it's interesting to see like the differences between like the actual molecule that's in the plant versus what they're able to extract versus what they're selling and, and shooting up versus smoking versus snorting. Like there, there's very big differences in those. In, in the routes that they call those ROAs, route of administration, mm -hmm. um, affects they, some of the other chemicals and just how quickly they, it is the same chemical in the coca so leaf. Different glands have different amounts of receptors. Different amounts of receptors and different, um, different mechanisms for bringing it into the bloodstream. Chewing coca leaves, you're letting it in, enter your bloodstream by going mm -hmm. underneath your your mucous membranes in your mouth, mm -hmm. um, which the way that the blood flow naturally goes, it bypasses your liver um, for on its first time through, uh, and it does enter your bloodstream relatively quickly. But you're also going doing an extraction process where you're extracting it from the plant cells into your saliva, and then from your saliva through the mucous membrane, which slows it down. As opposed to if you just take powdered cocaine and put it in your mouth, it's just got to go into your, it's all just has to dissolve. It's already extracted and that speeds up the whole process. Gotcha. And if you do that over an even more, an even smaller area 
um, in your nasal passages, then it hits even faster and it sits right there in the same spot and gets the and dissolves faster through the mucous membrane. Even faster than that is inhaling it because there's so much more surface area in your lungs. It's the same basic process. Just the it's just the concentration you allow it to hit your end. Your your lungs are literally dissolved or designed to have as much surface area and as much transfer into the bloodstream as possible because we're evolved to transfer oxygen that way. If you substitute the oxygen with something else, it transports to that really, really quickly. Um, it's the same chemical, but the different routes, they all have their different side effects and their different like, long-term effects. So the acidic form would be, have the same effects as the basic form. The basic form has a lower vaporization point. So okay. that's why you smoke the free base form and you, uh, and, but the non-free base form, the salt form, the hydrochloride, um, is soluble in water, and the free base isn't. Gotcha. So that's the really, the, literally the only difference between cocaine and crack is, is it protonated or not? Is it soluble in water versus is it something that you, that you could vaporize easily? Interesting um, stuff, back then they were having fun because they had a lot of uh, cocaine okay. and they had a lot of they were just terrible. It. They they were just really yeah, yeah, so. while we're still waiting for Ed to come back, the reason that this is worth talking about is because this is one of the really, really obvious interactions between science and politics mm -hmm. and policy is the difference in sentencing guidelines for crack versus cocaine. It's literally the exact same drug, except that one form was made available by the CIA is not conspiracy theory. There's records yeah. showing that the CIA sold crack in inner cities in the United States in the seventies and eighties. Mostly black. In mostly black communities. And then Lo and behold, there's different sentencing guidelines for crack versus cocaine at the same time because there is literally it's done on purpose. It's not on yeah. accident, and there's no scientific reason why they should have different sentencing guidelines. Um, other than, I guess there is there. There's no scientific reason. The reason is very obvious. It's racism. Politics and racism. Um, My buddy worked for USPS in the '80s, and he said, well, they wouldn't look at any of the product that they were moving, but they would move from uh, San Francisco to Puerto Rico. And one of his shipments back from Puerto Rico had fallen off the lift, and it was just all cocaine. It was, it was a wild time <laughs> back in the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we um, had a mayor here who was a cocaine dealer. I do recall that. Yeah, that was like the 90s, I think. Yeah. Before me, but... <laughs> So funny to hear that. The history was, it's all crazy. <laughs> it's all crazy. Right. Stuff. It is, it is. And worth, worth remembering. So you know how many dollars we are. Between science and politics. Yeah. yeah. Um, the lack thereof. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So switching gears a little bit um, into drawing these structures. We're, the rest of the day, we're not going to get to resonance today, um, but we're going to talk about drawing these structures in different ways. And I wanted to show you, remember when we talked about shifting your frame of reference when it comes to formal charge and counting how many bonds things have? Um, turns out, turns out you can dial this down even to uh, even more basic for positions. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, now this guy, Chris Berry, actually is a PhD in um, in physics, and he wrote a bunch of these like explaining scientific concepts to. They're not really for babies. And you can actually use them to explain these concepts to college students. Um, or they uh, the one on quantum mechanics and the one on statistical mechanics are both actually. Like, yeah, no, that's accurate, but it's explained in a way you can explain it to a four-year-old. I got one for um, my nephew and give it to him. They're actually, Chris Berry, is, he also, um, there's a book, so my my youngest son's name is Kuiper, um, after the uh, the Kuiper belt, which is where Pluto is. Um, not 
just for that, also for the Giants commentator, Dwayne Kuyper. So it's a baseball science um, twofer. Um, but so we, Chris Ferry also wrote a kid's book about why Pluto's not a planet anymore, explaining all the, the in terms that it's that a two-year-old can understand, um, more or less. Um, so the guy is really smart, and then in the areas that are not his expertise, he brings in other guest authors. Kara Florence has a PhD in biochemistry um, that they used to write this book, and it's actually pretty accurate. If you look at it, this is a ball. This ball can stick to two other balls. This ball can stick to three others. This ball can stick to four others. So oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, right? Each type of ball can stick to a certain number of other balls. Look, think of all the shapes we can make just by combining these. So, <laughs> These balls are like atoms. The atoms make up everything. Each type of atom can stick to a certain number of other atoms. And then it just starts saying, okay, so it's a carbon atom. It can stick to four other atoms and starts showing examples of how you can link them together. But this is exactly what we were just talking about last week, right? Just like not starting with atoms, starting by talking about balls instead. In fact, some of the molecules that are on our example slide that we're going to be talking about later today, there's Acetyl salicylic acid, aspirin, which was literally just on our slide a second ago. Um, and then they always end with, and now you're a quantum quantum physicist, and now you know organic chemistry. <laughs> um, so, like, you know, yes, obviously we're going to take it a little more in depth than that, but I thought that those were a pretty good way of like shift your frame of reference. You don't it doesn't have to be super complex numerical when it comes to a lot of this stuff. We're going to get, but at its most basic, it's just how many bonds can everything make? So this one is going to be, I don't really like drawing complete structures because it's drawing a lot of atoms. Uh, we will do it a few times, but basically what I'm more interested in for most of these um, com complete structure problems is can you get to the right molecular formula? Because you can't get the right molecular weight unless you know how many hydrogens and carbons and oxygens and nitrogens you have, right? And everything except for the hydrogens is explicitly drawn here, right? Every, every line represents a bond between two atoms, two heavy atoms, by which I mean heavy atoms is anything that's not hydrogen, basically. And so the, what you're trying to do here, the reason I'm testing you on complete structures is I want to know if you can count to four, but not five, <laughs> right? Never five atom or five bonds. No, they, that's also what's known as a, a Texas carbon because everything's bigger in Texas. I think I'm too smart down there. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. I have friends in Texas. They think the same of us in California. That's true. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> I sure did, didn't I? How did I do that? Oh, it's, it's not a benzene, that's why. <laughs> I missed the carbon in there. For the aspirin here. The trick is to draw all the atoms out and then 
and add enough hydrogens to everything so that everything has the right number of bonds. This one just has oxygens and carbons and hydrogens. So we don't need to worry about any nitrogens. And for the oxygens, all of the, the hydrogens are drawn in. So this is an example of one of those where it's kind of like a hybrid, technically, for it to be a skeletal structure. You don't need to write that hydrogen there. As long as that oxygen is, doesn't have a charge, you can assume it has the right number of hydrogens. But it's still more common in a lot of places for them to write in hydrogens on non-carbon atoms, just to explicitly say what state it's in. Um, like we were talking about earlier, uh, actually might have been just me and, and uh, Zeke. Um, when you protonate some of these lone pairs to give it a charge, um, you do wind up with the charge changing, but you wind up with the number of lone pairs and hydrogens changing along with it. And so sometimes it's easier to be explicit about these non-carbon atoms. So what would the molecular formula be in this case? How many carbons are there? Nine. Six, seven, eight, nine. I get nine too. Yeah, I got only three oxygens. Four oxygens. Four, four, five, six, seven, eight. I get eight. Zero, seven, eight. Yes. When it's drawn out as the complete structure, it's really straightforward. Trying to get to here from there is requires you to do a little bit more mental work. It's doable. But for now, while you're still getting used to it, it's not a bad idea. If I ask you for the molecular formula, to start by drawing the complete structure. Don't be stingy with your paper in this class. When in doubt, just, like, just get out another sheet of scratch paper, another, um, another slide on your tablet or whatever you're using, right? Get, I have tons of scratch paper too. I have notebooks if anybody needs, just wants like a whole big stack of paper that they can come, that they can use. But that's, one of the biggest rules here, don't try to be too, um, try to fit in too small space. I even ran into a problem here, right? You don't want to get your answer wrong because you ran out of space at the side of your paper because you were decided it wasn't worth drawing another piece of paper or getting another piece of paper out. I can't, that's how you <laughs> All right. What about? Acetaminophen. Pretty quickly too, when you get the hang of it, you can start, leave the carbons just as without drawing the C and just drawing the H's for the sake of counting. So I get C8. Okay. Uh, five, six, nine hydrogens. Two oxygens and a nitrogen. For organic chemistry, we also don't get too picky on the order of the elements here, although we usually start with carbons. And if you look at most textbooks, molecular formulas, it's all, it's usually going to go carbons, then hydrogens, and then at whatever else is in there. But as long as you're starting with the carbons, the rest of the order for the rest of it doesn't really matter. You're not going to get marked down um, because you wrote NO2 instead of O2N or anything like that. All right. Does everybody feel like you can count to four, but not five? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I flatter myself. My students don't usually make that mistake on, on the midterm. By the time we get to the midterm, everybody's got the handle on 
nothing has more than four bonds. All right, so I'll leave caffeine. We don't need to do caffeine. Let's try translating the other way. Instead of going from my skeletal structure to complete, let's start from complete and go to skeletal. So a lot of times it can be, if you've got a couple of points of reference within the molecule, it can be helpful to just sort of pick something and make it the middle uh, it's to get uh, the bond angles right. In, remember that all of these are going to be either tetrahedral or trigonal planar with that. So if you have a part of the molecule you know is linear, it can be helpful to put that right in the middle because then you can get the angles relatively close if you start with this, and this is one where, especially when I'm first drawing it, even though I said put it in skeletal structure, um, it can be helpful to draw the carbons out because otherwise it looks like that. And that's hard to tell what's going on there, right? Because these this carbon-carbon triple bond is linear it can be helpful to actually explicitly write the carbons. Then everything else, we have sp2 carbon, so trigonal planar, and then a carbon and a carbon. Then on the other side, we have one carbon and then an oxygen. And then one carbon, two carbons, OH. So your orientation could be a little bit different, but it should look more or less the same. The main thing is that you get the right number of carbons in between all these different groups which this is as good a time as any to start talking about what we call functional groups. And a functional group in organic chemistry is just anytime you've got a group of atoms that have some particular identifying characteristic about them. So this carbon-carbon triple bond, that's an identifying characteristic. That triple bond behaves differently, reacts differently, has a different shape than any other carbons. So, when we are, are looking at these molecules, a lot of times what will happen is because if we have a bunch of different parts of a molecule that all look different from each other, they're gonna have different reactivities. An OH group is gonna react differently than an oxygen that's in between two carbons. And both of those are gonna react differently than a carbon-carbon triple bond, which is gonna react differently than a carbon-carbon double bond. So we assign different names to each of these types of groups. And as a whole, all of those, everything that I circled here is, is called a functional group. And even just a regular sp3 carbon is a functional group. An sp3 carbon that's just completely saturated with other hydrogens and carbons, like these ones right here, that's a functional group as well. Those functional group. Um, and the, so we are going to use different vocabulary to describe these. 
Um, and because we didn't talk about this idea last week, it wasn't on the quiz last week. Um, normally, this is on our first, our week one quiz. It's basically, the, let's get these names down so that I can use the term alcohol and everybody knows what I'm talking about. We're not going to talk about how to name alcohols versus alkenes versus alkynes until we get to their respective chapters. But I want everybody to recognize the functional groups so that I can point to a molecule and say, look at the alcohol part or look at the ether. All right, so there's a, um, a figure from um, a, uh, a chemistry, a guy who, who is a chemist, I believe he's based in the UK, um, who also has an interest in graphic design, who designs a bunch of these um, posters that are really helpful. Um, We'll use a number of them. The name of the, the blog that he maintains is called Compound Chemistry. Um, it was called Compound Interest, but then he kept getting too many economists. I thought that that was more clever. Um, <laughs> it still says Compound Interest. It still says Compound Interest, but the, the uh, website is Compound Chem. Oh, I see it. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But so basically what this, all this is, is a list of the most common functional groups, most common arrangements of atoms that have their own distinct way of reacting. So if you just have sp3 carbons and hydrogens, that's a group called an alkane. All right, so the alkanes are what we've been talking about. Mostly what we're gonna start, we're gonna start with naming alkanes because that's gonna form the basis of all the rest of the nomenclature. And then as what we're gonna do for naming alkanes really well, everything else is just a small tweak to that. Um, but anytime you see anything that ends in A-N-E, ane, that means that it's it's an alkane and doesn't really have any other functional groups present. So like octane, butane, propane, methane, those are all alkanes that don't have other functional groups. If you have a carbon-carbon double bond, it's an alkene. Carbon-carbon triple bond, it's an alkyne. And that's, that's all of the hydrocarbon ones for the most part. We'll talk about cyclo groups in their own, that's, they could consider them functional groups, but for the most part, they behave just like regular alkanes. So um, cyclo groups are not really all listed on here as being different. Um, all of the oxygen-based ones are here. Well, they're in the green ones. Alcohols and ethers, our molecule we just had, had an OH group, that's an alcohol. If you have an oxygen with two single bonds and it's between two carbons instead of between a carbon and a hydrogen, it's an ether. Um, and then this is a special case. If you wind up with a, a cyclic ether between two carbons where you get this weird three-sided ring where the oxygen is one of the pieces, that's an epoxide, which is where epoxies get their name. An epoxy, the two tubes, one of the tubes is an epoxide, and the other tube is something that breaks open this three-sided ring and lets it react. So you basically, an epoxy turns into one giant molecule as it cures. All of the different epoxides wind up linking with the other molecules, which link with other epoxides, and you wind up with it set. That's why you can't like recast them or anything, and they don't dissolve in anything. Uh, because they literally are one molecule once they set. You can break them, but you have to just physically have to break them apart. You can't dissolve them or recast or heat them up to soften them or anything like that. Once they're set, they're set. Um, these groups, all the green ones, are what are called um, carbonyl groups because there's another classification, we're going to keep adding more vocab, but anytime you've got a carbon-oxygen double bond, that is a, is a, a subcase, is that a sub-functional group, or is it a, a larger part of the classification? A carbon-oxygen double bond is a carbonyl. It's the umbrella. It's, that's the umbrella, thank you. And then all of these green functional groups are different carbonyl groups. 
They're all slightly different from each other. Aldehydes and ketones are pretty similar to each other. The rest of these are all pretty similar to each other. What are called, these are, I didn't re re uh, review this before class. I believe these are the class two carbonyls and these are class one carbonyls, but I might have that back. It doesn't matter right now to you. Um, the main thing is, is that we start getting these names down, especially for these first two rows. The nitrogen-based compounds, we're gonna add as we go, um, but they don't show up nearly as often. Um, so we'll start adding those in a little bit later. Is it possible to have like an ether haloalkane? Yeah, so all of the, just like the, the last example we did had a bunch of different functional groups on it, right? It has alkane bits, alkenes, alkynes, and ether and an alcohol all in one molecule. And then more like the structure of the ether, like the, the halogen would be between two carbons? No, because the halogen is only going to make carbon. one bond. So you can have something like this that would not be on our list, the common functional groups. That's going to be really unstable. That's going to probably rearrange itself to put the chlorine over here and one of the hydrogens move over there. And you'd wind up with the chlorine on attached to the carbon and an alcohol attached to the carbon. Um, because if it's just an oxygen, putting two electronegative elements right next to each other, they're basically both going to find more electron rich groups around them and, and wind up forming bonds there. What you did is you put you put the little kid with all of the good toys ne in, um, next to one bully who's fighting off another bully. What's really going to happen is the two bullies are both going to pick on the little kid. <laughs> Interesting stuff. <laughs> it's, 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 not, it's not a bad way to think about it. Basically, the more electronegative elements are bullies or the NFL teams, you prefer. Um, and the, the more electron rich weaker groups are the ones that are, are good targets for them. All right, so here's just a, a dictionary definition of a functional group, not dictionary. I don't think functional group is in the dictionary, but it's in our chemistry textbook. So it's a textbook definition. Uh, it's just a characteristic group of atoms or bonds that produce predictable chemical behavior. So here, the reason this is a useful example is that all of these molecules, they all have an alkene group. And all of those alkene groups, when you expose it to hydrogen gas on, and platinum, that you wind up breaking the alkene, this pi bond, and you form two new carbon hydrogen bonds. So it doesn't matter what alkene we're dealing with, it'll have similar reactive properties. It doesn't matter what the rest of the molecule looks like. If you have larger molecules that have a bunch of functional groups, like the last one we just looked at, there might be other things that happen as well. But if we took this molecule and we put it with hydrogen gas over platinum, that's going to do the same thing as the other page. It just also will happen here. If we have enough hydrogen, it'll also happen there. And then you might have something else happening with these oxygens. I don't think so. I think those oxygens would stay the way they were. But basically, anytime you can point to a group of atoms that have that behave the same way, no matter what the conditions are, that's a functional group. And this is this is why it's useful to think about it this way. Um, and this is also one of the reasons that people that just try to memorize their way through OCHEM wind up getting into trouble, because you can memorize that this reaction happens, but you can't memorize all possible reactants that I could ask this about, right? You have to be able to look at this molecule and recognize, hey, there's an alkene and an alkene and these reactants do this. Regardless of what your, the rest of the molecule looks like, you have to be able to classify them rather than just memorize, here's a, re a reaction that happens. Here's a group of reactions that happen. That's a little bit trickier. Would this always be certain, like an uh, alkene functional group in this? And these conditions would always go back to an alkane. We can we can split hairs a little bit as far as what the yields would look like, but in general, yes. Unless there's some weirdness 
Like if we, if our alkene group was completely surrounded by something else that prevents the hydrogen from getting in or prevents it from, when we look at the mechanism of this reaction, how it actually happens, it one, turns out that the, one of the steps involves the alkene group basically sticking to the, the platinum surface. And that's part of what breaks the pi bonds. Um, if you have it, if you have a much larger group such that you can't actually get to the alkene because there's too much other stuff going around, going on around it, it might wind up affecting the yields. You might only get like 40% yield instead of 95% yield. Um, but in general, yeah, all alkenes short of benzene. Whenever aromatics get involved, that's another story yeah, because we have that true. resonance. Yeah. yeah. But that's why alkenes are that's why alkenes and aromatics are two different functional groups. A benzene ring looks like it's just a bunch of alternating alkenes, but it actually is more complicated because of the resonance. And that's why it gets its own classification. Uh, this is just another way of classifying those. I like that poster because graphically, I think it looks really good. It has a lot of information without looking too cluttered. Um, but this is, a, you know, they're all going to have about the same information. Um, alkyl halides just mean you have a halogen attached, or sometimes you hear those called uh, halo alkanes. Two ways of saying the same thing. Alkenes, alkynes, alcohols, ethers. If it's a sulfur instead of an oxygen, but other than that, it looks like an alcohol, it's called a thio. T-H-I-O is a prefix that means sulfur in chemistry. So anytime you see T-H-I, um, you should be thinking sulfur. What, is it for sulfur? Wouldn't surprise me. I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, not my captains? No, maybe three. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So this this is just an example of how we can look at one molecule and we can label different parts of it. Part of your quiz this weekend, next weekend, is going to be here is a big molecule like this. Label all the functional groups you can find just like we did on the last page, just like we're going to do with this and the allopril right here. So you see what groups of atoms do you see here that we could potentially label? Well, there's a benzene. There's a benzene. So that's a phenyl or an aromatic or Close. So that when you have an ether next to a carbonyl, is that right? there's the carboxyl. Okay. Right on. Mm -hmm. So there's carboxyl or carboxylic acid is the more complete term. An aldehyde, right? Or also close. So when you have a carbonyl, when you have a carbonyl next to an oxygen, a carbonyl next to an OH, that's a carboxylic acid. An oxygen and then another carbon, so it's kind of like an ether. An ether plus a carbonyl is an ester. I got it. If you have a nitrogen attached to a carbon with no carbonyl, that's an amine. They all have a, a prefix form as well. Like because based on how you name things, there's like the, the prefix form, which is, is kind of like using an adjective, the adjective version of it um, versus the noun form. So this is a carboxylic acid, or you could say it's a carboxyl group. Carboxyl is the adjective form. Carboxylic acid is the noun. They all kind of have two ways of saying things. So this is an amine group or an amino group. If you're the prefix form, the adjective form is amino, but they mean the same thing. That's an amide. So an amine next to a carbonyl is an amide. 
just like an ether next to a carbonyl is an ester. In or so out of the ring? Either, doesn't matter. Okay. If you have a carbonyl next to an ether, that's an ester. And they can be That's a cyclic ester that has its that has its own name for biology reasons because this mole molecules like this show up in biology. And a lot of times you see the same thing with cyclic uh, ethers. Um, glucose has two forms of that look like I'm gonna mess up with stereochemistry, but there's Right. <laughs> that's glucose right there. That's the ring form of glucose. You take this version of glucose and you expose it to either an acid or a base, the ring breaks apart and this oxygen becomes another OH attached over here. So there's there's biological, biochem reasons why these have their own separate categorization. <laughs> Um, but if it's a cyclic ester or a cyclic ether, they have their own names because they react a little bit differently than an ether that's in the, just in the middle of the straight chain. This wouldn't be considered an alcohol. This would be considered just its own group because... This is a carbohydrate. Right. <laughs> and carbohydrates have the same rough ratio of oxygen for every carbon and two hydrogens for every carbon. So the same general form in most of the oxygens are in the form of OHs, but if you, um, but depending on the way that it's the conditions and what else is going on in the cells, it can be in this ring form or it can be in an open chain form that looks has slightly different functional groups in the, the two forms. So even though each of these individually is an alcohol as a whole, we would call this just a carbohydrate. Um, or in the case of artificial sweeteners, artificial sweeteners, you many of them are basically are a lot of times you hear them called um, some versions of them are called sugar alcohols. You've heard that like the low carb but not the full zero calorie energy drinks or sodas and things like that. Um, we'll have a molecule that looks a lot like this, so it triggers the same taste receptors, but it has fewer calories. Um, there's a couple ways that they do that, mostly by just having less of it. If it, a lot of times those artificial sweeteners or the sugar alcohols actually hit your taste receptors more intensely. They have a stronger binding affinity for your for your taste receptors um, than real sugar does, and so you use less of them. They might have just as many calories per molecule, but if they bind to the sweet receptors on your tongue 300 times as strongly, you can use one three hundredth of the molecules. So even like zero calorie diet sodas don't actually have zero zero calories. There's zero calories within sig figs. Right. All that's within sig figs. Right? All that's within sig figs. They have zero calories within sig figs because you can use 300 times less aspartame than you would use. Um, sugar. I don't think you're too far off track. I, we only have five minutes left anyway. Go ahead. I was going to say, I've heard it's less than half a calorie per serving, but making round down. I believe it's five. If you look at most of the um, nutritional facts, they never have calories um, okay. that are in, that always either end in zeros or fives, because really they're plus or minus five calories. So, if it's half a calorie per serving, they can definitely round down. But I think if it's less than like well, two know, and a half, that's or even less more than, convenient. Right. Um, but yeah, there's you know, a big two liter bottle of Diet Coke. If you look at the nutritional facts on like a 44 ounce um, cup at, the, at a fast food restaurant or something like that, it'll say five calories. But a 20 ounce has zero calories. Yeah, interesting. Um, and they're, they're relatively helpful in a lot of ways, but you just have to understand your uncertainty right. and how it can be used to mislead people. <laughs> as far as uh, caloric intake and polar molecules, would a non-polar molecule yield more calories in the human body than 
in a human body is the trick there because your body the body gets sent around with proteins. proteins. Because, because like gasoline has a ton of calories. But we don't we don't have the the proteins, the enzymes necessary to actually break it down and get those calories. So more so a nonpolar molecule has more calories typically because carbon carbon bonds and carbon hydrogen hydrogen bonds are more energy dense than carbon oxygen bonds. But with the caveat that you have to be able to actually break it down. Um, which is, and I believe you probably can drink gas. Don't go do this. You can probably <laughs> drink gasoline without any, with much in the way of ill effects because there's, it'll just pass right through. Your body won't really absorb it because it can't do anything with it. I've tried gasoline before just from, say, from siphoning. Yeah. So, like, I mean, other than, than when you get the fumes and you actually just, and the fumes even aren't really toxic, they just, deprive you of oxygen, take up the space in your lungs that oxygen would normally be in. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, hydrocarbons are pretty harmless humans, other than the fact that they're explosive. <laughs> um, and they can probably get in the way of other things. But as soon as you add something like a carboxylic acid group to the end of a saturated hydrocarbon, now you've got a saturated fat. And saturated fats basically give our enzymes a handle that they can grab onto and start breaking it down. You need that carboxylic acid group at the end of a chain of uh, carbons and hydrogens in order for the, our enzymes to be able to do anything with it. Wow. So we're talking in too broad vocabulary to be asking this question right now. <laughs> a, little, a little bit, yeah. I mean, so this is why biochemistry is a separate field than organic chemistry, because organic chemistry tells us just the physical side of things. And then biochemistry says, whoa, 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 we can't actually use that energy right. because we have all these other restrictions because it's a living cell. So we'll end there. That's a perfect place to end. Um, and I'm watching a video about like, you know, my stream